Hello and welcome to our ninth annual HP Systems Summit. Welcome back. Many of you probably attended some of our previous summits. There are, I'm sure, many of you that are new to this summit today. This is the place where we get everyone in the HP Systems community together to present some of the content that has been developed over the past year, to celebrate some of the wins, to recognize community members. And by the way, don't miss our awards ceremony at the end of today, at the final piece of the plenary sessions. And certainly we have a day that is packed with content. We have so much good content that is very hard to say what's the real gold nugget. Between plenary sessions, we will see some of them now, then all of the breakouts and back to the plenary sessions later on. Um, you will, I'm sure you're gonna be here for a treat. This is going to be a real, real, real exciting day. And this is not the only piece of exciting news that I have for you. As you can see, the website has a completely new look. We have a new logo, if you haven't noticed as well, but also the entire look and feel of the website now looks modern. And we put cloud, Kubernetes, container-based HPC deployments front and center. This is going to be that hub of information where you can access all of these new developments on HPCC, plus everything else that was available there before. That's not going away. So I'm sure you're gonna like what you see. Now, to other topics, there are a few housekeeping things that are quite important. Attend every session that you can. There are some sessions that overlap with each other, obviously, because we have breakouts. Attend one of them or two. And if you can't attend some of those sessions, don't worry, they are all recorded. So you can always go back and, and watch all of this later on when you have a little bit of time. Participate. If you attend any sessions, please interact. You have a chat feature there. You can interact with others. Don't forget to make mentions in social media. Just go and post some of your experience there and interact with other community members. Even though the content is great, and I, I'm pretty sure you will enjoy all of the content that we have today, but I think the most important aspect of this conference is the ability to socialize, to um, get people that are like-minded together, to maybe enable yourself and uh, find some common interest that you can leverage for your next project. And all of this while centered on HP systems. So don't neglect that part of the conference. And we have some of the plenary sessions now. We will be um, hosting some uh, key members of the community for the next keynotes. Then we will have the breakouts. And last but not least, we will come back to the plenary session, as I said before, for the closing sessions and the award ceremony. Don't forget to watch that. Now, I want to welcome you to our first keynote of the day. This keynote is with Adway Shoshi, who is one of our prime community members. He is the founder of Data Sears, and he will tell us all about how they use HP systems in these critical production ready environments. Welcome, Adwait, and let's have a chat. Thank you, Flavio, for the introduction. And yes, that's right. Some of you have seen me before uh, speak at the in person HPCC events. Uh, this is a little bit different. So, for those who know me, um, I will be giving a little bit of update of who we are and where we are. And for those who don't know me, uh, I am the CEO of Data Sears. I call myself the Chief Seer because everything is around the word Seer. What actually means is to see. And the motto of our organization is to see through data. So we see things through data that other people cannot. And uh, to be honest, HPCC helps us unlock that. Uh, so what do we see through data? So we are in the financial services space. Uh, we look at financial transactions and consumer profiles, risk rate them, and try to figure out if they are trying to launder money, if they are trying to commit fraud, if they're trying to steal somebody's identity, amongst a lot of things. But we just have not stopped there. We actually have created an ecosystem where that data 
can be used in multiple different ways beyond fraud and risk, which obviously happens to be a big problem in the industry today. But the same data can be used for traditional analytics. So things like, why am I losing customers? How can I gain more customers? What are my consumers trying to tell me? What are my most profitable channels? What are my least profitable channels? That way you can control where do you spend the marketing dollars. Uh, things like on finance is when I'm reconciling my books, adding all the money at the end of the day, who do I owe how much? Who owes me how much? All of that is driven through the same data. So think about it that we do ETL once and all of these insights are unlocked across multiple different channels. And that's what we as a company do. Uh, I always tell people that you know we are the middle office and back office solution for banking and payments, which doesn't sound too sexy, but that's where actually the work gets done, right? That's where the real day-to-day -day operations are, which basically means that it may not be sexy, but it's super sticky. And because of how, what we do and how we do it, it actually ends up being really good looking and super sexy on top of HPCC. That's right, that's great. That is a great introduction and a good segue to some of the topics that I want to cover in this discussion. One of those is which parts as, um, as a component does HP systems play in your ecosystem? Um, so what aspects of your business are handled by HP systems and which ones are, are handled by other technology platforms? Yeah. To uh, talk about that, you have to understand some of the problems that exist in the space today. Like for example, when a bank says, okay, I wanna work with a new FinTech or I wanna work with a new processor. And a processor is nothing but a person who is processing the payments. There are many out there, we are in Atlanta. So we can give shout out to like the FISs of the world, the global payments, the world pays and so on and so forth, the TCSs. Each one has their processing platform. They do things the way they do it. Then they dump that data to the bank and say, okay, here is what you asked me to provide you. The bank then looks at it and says, okay, I don't know how to all bring it in. So they spend a ton of time ingesting that data, cleaning it, homogenizing it, because we all know garbage in, garbage out. So how do you drive insight? And millions and millions of dollars are spent and there are technologies out there and, and vendors out there that will take your dollars. And they will say, hey, I have this amazing data platform and I want you to use this, right? The challenge is not the platform. Challenge is that people don't know what to do with it. So what did we do differently and where did HPCC help us? Is If you look at it, our use case is very similar to LexisNexis's use case. You have multiple sources of data that are telling you different things coming from different sources, some legacy, some more modern. So you have JSON, XML on one side and traditional flat files you know, that are coming out of green screen on the other side. We have to take it in, we have to connect all the dots, we have to homogenize it, and we have to create a data repository in the middle that drives value out of it, right? Which includes for us, value means reporting that comes out of it, uh, insights that come out of it, machine learning algorithms that we run out of it. So all of that for us runs on HPC systems, right? I don't have to have a third party ETL tool. I don't have to have a third party reporting tool. None of that. All of this runs on top of HPC systems for us. Uh, we have integrated to 50, 60 different payments providers. So what that means to us is fast to market, which means we can implement a customer as less as two weeks. Um, and you know we can code to somebody new in between four to six weeks, which is unheard of in the industry. Uh, typically when we uh, came to the industry in 2017, the implementation time cycles have been one year, 18 months, two years, and so on and so forth. And by the way, this implementation is also costing them uh, dollars, right, by the hour. So the longer it goes, somebody is getting super rich doing this, right? But the product is not live. And so we fundamentally changed that saying, we are gonna focus more on getting the product live uh, and getting it done right. So HPCC helped us tremendously. But you know, the way I look at HPCC, it's a very technical tool, obviously. It's, a, it, you know, it's meant for technologists and it meant for developers and so on and so forth. So how does a business user interact with HPCC? So we developed uh, technology around it, right? So think about it this way that we have a curtain and the curtains, uh, you know, showing the, the, the movie and it's, it's beautiful, but there is amazing things going on behind the curtain. There is teams of people, you know, data orchestration, synchronization, things are moving here and there. Think about the old style theater production, right? You see what's in front of the curtain. You actually don't see what's behind, but there is a lot more fun going on behind than there is going on in the front to coordinate all of this, right? So that's us. So the, the behind the stage for us is HPCC. 
in front of the stage is stuff like Node.js and React, which is very popular in the industry. Facebook has made it popular. Airbnb has made it popular. So we use Node and React, and we just use web services to communicate back and forth with HPCC. So a user can pull whatever data they want, pull up whatever report they want, have their workflows designed while they're interacting with HPCC in, in real time. So the data is actually coming in to us in real time. We use Thor to ingest data in real time, which is you know very rare, right? So we have technologies where we'll take the data into an API, it goes in a queue, Thor is pulling that queue while there is decisions being made by Roxy on the fly. So the customer knows, hey, this is what has happened. And so we have developed these pipelines, right? Faster pipeline for data, slower pipeline for data. So things happen during the night where more cleaning will happen. So the data that's you know clean up to let's say 80%, you know, uh, within the hour could be clean 90% by the end of the day, could be clean 99% by end of the week, and so on and so forth. So all of that orchestration is actually done through UI for us. And that entire UI sits in a very powerful application called Seer Portal. So for us. We are able to do MDM, which is master data management, auth auditing, authentication, authorization, all of that through our layer. But the real PCI, PII data is sitting in HPCC, which is completely encrypted, access control, and nobody can connect to it except, you know, as you go through the right channels and, and, and connectors. That is a very cool implementation. I really enjoy all of these moving parts and the fact that HP Systems is powering this behind the scenes. But... Tell me a little bit more about the ECL code base that you have. Yeah, now you hinted at a fairly large chunk of work that is happening on HP systems, and all of that must have some ECL development behind the scenes, right? So how, yes. how are you dealing with all of this? Do you have your own team of ECL developers? How do you feed that team? Do you have a pipeline of people that can join your organization on, on time when you need them? Yeah, so some of the things that we did very early is we developed uh, some building blocks, right? So when you go into our code, and let's say I want to run or read one day's worth of transactions, right? You're not writing very complex ECL. You're basically going and saying this dot, this dot, this dot, they read, right? And giving a date. So it does all the work behind you. So obviously we have this complex structure of how our data is organized, where it is compressed, where it is indexed and all of that. So the, the writing of the code mostly these days has become abstract, right? So you basically run one line of code that gets you exactly the data you want. Then you manipulate that data and write one line of code to write it exactly where you want to write it, right? So the, the, the response is, you know, the read and write has been completely abstracted. And in the middle, you have to just figure out how do you want to transform the data, right? Now, the beauty is, you know, when I first started learning ECL, I tell all this to our uh, young kids here. When I started learning ECL, I didn't want to do it. It's like something new, right? You have tremendous resistance. You have denial saying, why, want to, why do you want to use this? You know, there's other tools out there, but it happens with everything. And then you kind of accept it like, wait, I'm starting to get the hang of it now. Then you go and say, wow, I really like it now. And then you fall in love, right? And you're like, oh, oh my God, this is so easy. So, you know, we make sure that we take all of our employees through that process saying it's okay to hate ECL when you first join. There's nothing wrong with it, right? If you didn't hate it and you loved it, I would be like, is there something wrong with you? Like you should hate it, it's different, right? That's human nature. And so one of the challenges we have is recruiting uh, from these- I apologize for interrupting. Uh, someone once said, I was born to learn ECL and uh, that was a little <laughs> bit suspicious. <laughs> well, so I, I tell you this, a person told me that, uh, you know, I dream in uh, SQL. So I said, explain your dreams to me just using SQL, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then he was like, wait, I can't. So, you know, uh, these kids have a tremendous resistance because what they're chasing really is they're chasing uh, usually money and jobs and positions. So somebody tells them that, listen, if you learn R, I'll make you a data scientist. If you run, uh, learn Scala or, or Python, I'll make you a data scientist. So they're just chasing those titles. What I tell these people is that Data science really is 90, 95% of understanding that data and knowing how to use it and 5% of algorithms, right? Because you're not really writing those algorithms. If you don't know how to use that data, then what are you going to do? And, and, and the amount of time it actually takes you from unusable data to usable data using ECL versus any other code, it's ECL is at least 10 times more efficient from our perspective, right? It's quirky. 
it's quirky. I'll call it what it is. It has its own ways of doing things. Like we, a lot of people ask us, well, why does it skew? Why, why is this, right? So I give them an example, right? You have 10 pieces of candy and you have to evenly distribute it amongst five people. How would you do it? Well, each one gets two. Well, now we have 11 pieces of candy. How are you going to distribute it evenly? You can't, right? Unless you start cutting the candy, right? And so that's where, you know, the things you have to think through. So teaching these young kids, we are, we are going to colleges, we are offering a job. We are moving those people to Atlanta because we are an in-person um, location here. We are not remote because some of these things are hard. You know, the ACL is not hard, but it's not easy until you get to that. So I always tell people the initial climb may look like this, but then after that, it's all plateau because it's all six functions. That's it. You master those six functions and that's it. You're a master of ACL. So we, we teach these kids. We set up sessions. Uh, we obviously go through the trainings, like everybody goes through Bob's trainings in our company. Everybody knows who Bob is in our company, right? Because they have gone through those trainings. Then we have our own training on top of it. And then, you know, we then take them through an advanced training because not everybody uses things, right? And our use case is different. We don't have a Thor, Thor programmer or a Roxy programmer or somebody who can maintain DALI or who can set up a machine. All of our people can do all of it, right? They know how gen indexes work. They know how Tor works. They know how H Tor works. They know how all of this orchestrates. So it's a little bit of a different mindset. And I prefer almost having a blank slate. Like I'll take a kid from college who, has, who knows nothing and teach them from scratch rather than a 10 year experienced person who's every day going to tell me that, you know, Hadoop is better, Hadoop is better, Hadoop is better. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's not that it's better. It's, you have to look at what's good for your use case. If Lexis invented technology for a use case of having multiple data sources, homogenizing it and driving value. And that's exactly our use case is taking these data sets, homogenizing it and driving value. Then why would we use something else? Right. Yeah. That is, that is a great answer. So, so, um, just to conclude, and I don't want to make this too long, uh, what, how do you see this playing in the future? Um, what do you think um, tomorrow will bring for your implementation of HP systems, your business, and your growth as a company? So HPCC has gotten us uh, speed and scale for sure. Um, you know, it has also gotten us quite a bit of stability, right? So the code is now very mature uh, and it's now quite stable to a point where, you know, we can make changes and we have so many things, fail safes in place that, you know, things will not fall apart. Uh, we are able to scale. We are just now going through a massive scaling of basically making sure that where we are now in terms of scale, and I'll give an example, we have 700 million odd accounts, about 50 billion transactions that we monitor for various different things that we do, right? Uh, the goal is to go from here to 30X. And you know, going from here to 30X, the infrastructure cost is negligible because you know, HPCC doesn't need something fancy. So we are able to use technology both from a hardware perspective and from a software perspective and create something that would typically cost us millions of dollars in licensing and AWS and Azure fees and so on and so forth, that we can do it at a fraction of a cost. And what that means is when companies spend, 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 and then somebody says, well, how are you gonna make money? And that's when they cut cost, cut cost, cut cost, cut cost. Mm -hmm. We actually have been spending very wisely so we have a very good profitability from that perspective, right? We don't, we are not spending what we don't need to spend. And HPCC, I think, gives us that it's it's a meat on the plate, right? It it gives us that fillet for the you know for for a price of a chicken wing, right? So that's that's where it it actually makes a lot of sense for us. So for, for us, scaling equals just making sure we can keep building. Uh, we have a lot of stuff to build a product around. Uh, the whole HPCC infrastructure. So HPCC will keep growing for us and, and adding more and more and more data as we grow because that's that's our heart and brain. This is great, Wait, And I need to thank you very much for this talk. Um, it's been quite enlightening. I really enjoy always talking to you about this. I see your practical view of things and how uh, they really had a positive impact in your business. Uh, you didn't overbuild things. You just build what you need it and you continue to leverage the same philosophy to grow your business as well. Um, so again, thank you very much for this talk. Thank and you for having me. For our second keynote now, we have Dr. Shoba, who comes from RVCE. She uh, is an experienced professor with more than two decades of experience, but also has been part of the HP Systems community for several years. She's been awarded community awards in the past, and she has just 
built, founded a new center for um, development of intelligent systems with sustainable solutions. This is quite interesting. This um, has the potential to bring HP systems to a new um, set of applications and nobody better than Dr. Shoba to tell us all about it. But before we go to Dr. Shoba, I want to also introduce her student. Rohan Maheswari is um, one of her students and has been working for the past several weeks on solutions around detecting illegitimate transactions in the Bitcoin blockchain. For many of us who know how difficult it is to do this in a blockchain, uh, because people that want to disguise their transactions find a myriad of ways to do that, will uh, truly understand and appreciate the work that Rohan has done. Using behavioral analytics, he could identify some of these illegitimate uh, transactions in the blockchain and has done all of this on HPC systems. So no more preamble. Please help me welcome Rohan and Dr. Shoba. Thank you, Fabilio, for introducing me. And hello, everybody. So today I'm here for this session, which I have my agenda as follows. So I'll be walking through the RVC HPCC systems, Center of Excellence in Cognitive Intelligence Systems for Sustainable Solution. And my student, Rohan, will be presenting his work that is analysis of transaction behavior in Bitcoin blockchain. Rohan is a student at RB College of Engineering and is in third semester. And he, will, he has worked on this project in, as a part of Center of Excellence. So coming to the history of RVCE and HPCC systems collaboration, just to speak about RVCE, it was established in the year 1963, recognized as one of the India's leading technical institution, accredited by NAC and NBE. Currently, the institution offers 13 bachelor, 16 master's program and doctoral studies, and all the departments have research center affiliated to VTU Belgavi. RVCE has 21 centers of excellence with focus on interdisciplinary research. Now it has joined hands with HPCC systems from LexisNexis Risk Solution, which is proven open source solution for big data insights that can be implemented by businesses of all sizes. So having established the center of excellence, it has a vision to facilitate young minds and professionals for pursuing research in cognitive intelligence system and develop sustainable innovative solution to solve real world problems. With a mission of its own, it, uh, it promotes interdisciplinary research and outcome-based education to nurture future experts in intelligent system and to develop sustainable innovative solution to solve real world problems. By utilizing open source tool for developing cognitive intelligence system and optimizing the resources. The members of the COE are the undergraduate and postgraduate students, PhD scholars, and we also have faculties from various departments expertised in embedded system, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data analytics, networking, and distributed computing necessary to build intelligent systems. Of course, we also have mentors from HPCC systems. The activities undertaken by the Center of Excellence includes consultancy, research and development, patents, and training to the various industry personnel and academicians, and also collaborating with industry, leveraging HPCC systems for data science and big data analytics. The key areas which we work are to explore computing architectures, such as HPCC systems, Hadoop, and GPU to get expertise in high performance computing techniques in big data analytics and to inculcate programming skills such as Java, Python, and ECL. With relevant programming skills will be developed to develop the prototype. Demonstrate case studies on intelligent system such as water sustainability, astronomical data, Bitcoin analysis, which helps the members to design and develop prototype 
for the interdisciplinary problem identified. And finally, we want to contribute to the open source community, such as ML libraries to HPCC machine learning burden, and also optimizing the compiler, which helps the members to learn new skills and technologies and to build confidence and reputation. Finally, the outcome of the Center of Excellence is publication in various reputed journals and conferences, publishing patents, technology transfer, and also to solve societal problems. The key activities taken by the Center of Excellence, even though it started recently, but we have collaborated from the 2019 to till today. So we concentrate on the research, okay, which includes um, the casualty model, then DB scan algorithm, then GAN in HPCC system, and also machine learning evaluation matrices. We have worked on the use cases like COVID-19 cases and vaccination data tracker in India, then detect the fraud in credit cards and human activity recognition, NLP to SQL queries on HPCC system, and develop recommendation system for a virtual reality-based supermarket using big data platforms. And finally, the Bitcoin analysis, which my student will be giving demonstration. Platform enhancement also, we have worked for improving the HSQL, interfacing the plugins like Octave, and, com and comparative study of HPCC with Hadoop system, and finding out how Hadoop is efficient, how HPCC is efficient than Hadoop. Then finally, ECL dependency graph. We also have contributed to the society and academic community by having a course on big data analytics using distributed computing for the past two years. Seminars and webinars are delivered, tech talks, hackathon, conference, and writing technical blogs, publishing journal conference papers. These are the few activities taken during the 2019 to 2020. So finally, we have seen that whatever we have worked on, whatever projects we have worked on, we have published this in reputed conferences and journals. These are the various uh, the journals like the International Journal of Artificial Intelligence. It is in Q2, Scopus Index. Then we have International uh, Journal of Engineering Application. It is Q4. And, like, uh, and all reputed li uh, libraries refer to our publications. The best practices that we have followed in the Center of Excellence include exploring the new challenges in HPCC systems platform, Mentoring by senior students and organizing training session, writing proposal for the possible funding from industry, working on research project, writing blogs and publishing research papers and posters, and of course, attending HPCC systems submit. So and to add further on this uh, uh, COE, we also have got awards. Myself have got uh, HPCC system community recognition award 2020, then Atreya Bain, is also has been awarded by HPCC System Community Choice Award in 2021. And myself and Professor Jyoti Shetty also have been awarded as a Mentor Recognition Award in 2021. This is about a brief of the activities undertaken and the best practices of COE. Coming to the roadmap ahead in 2022, already we have worked on academic projects, internship project, we, have, we are publishing and Akathon also we have conducted and post a presentation which we'll be presenting in the HPCC submit. Coming to 2023, we aim in increase in the number of research projects with a focus to the contributing to open source HPCC systems community. Increase in the number of collaboration for solving societal challenges. So in 2024-25, we, we would want to increase the collaboration with foreign universities for joint projects and publications. This is the roadmap, and thank you for your patience hearing. And over to Rohan for presenting his work on analysis of transaction behavior on the Bitcoin. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shivam, for uh, handing off to me. Hey, everyone, I'm uh, Rohan, and as Mom introduced me, I'm a third year student doing computer science at RVC. And for the last seven to eight months, I've been working with HPCC systems to make some open research progress on this particular topic, which is analyzing blockchain data to detect illicit transactions made using Bitcoin. 
Now it's very important to have some context as to why LexisNexis would need such a project. And at the very beginning of our project, our mentor Arjuna had sent this article, which I think really encapsulates the need for such a project. An ex-cop fell for Alice, then he fell for her $66 million crypto scam. Now that's that's a great headline because this talks about this article talks about how an ex-security consultant, someone who was trained to sniff out scams, fell for a huge mining pool scam. And sadly for us, this is probably not the last we're going to see of such headlines. And that's mainly because of these two graphs. The one on the left shows us how exponential the adoption of cryptocurrency has been, especially after the pandemic, the usage has just skyrocketed. And the one on the right tells us about the amount of cryptocurrency that has been traveling around and being used for illicit transactions. And in 2021 alone, we had $14 billion being passed around in stuff like terrorism financing, child abuse, fraud, scams. And so cryptocurrency has gone from something that, you know, maybe just a couple of nerds talk about to a real threat that we need to take care of. Now that I've sort of provided some context to the project itself, I'd like to talk about the actual technical um, or the actual technology we are using, which is Bitcoin. And this picture really encapsulates why Bitcoin came into being, the 2008 housing crisis. So when this crisis happened, there was a huge distrust in financial institutions amongst people. And there was this sort of resentment towards centralization of authority. And so a certain person, Satoshi, who we still don't know who this person is, came out with a paper in 2009 talking about a decentralized currency, which completely removed the need for trust. How exactly did he go about doing this? So step one is a transaction, right? Let's say I, Rohan, make a transaction with you, the audience, for five Bitcoin. Once I'm done with this transaction, I shout it out to everyone using Bitcoin, like, hey, I have made a transaction of five Bitcoin to the audience. And then there are these people, the miners, who, by the way, are re responsible for the silicon and GPU shortages, they listen for these transactions, they take them and they pack them up into blocks, which are on average 2,400 transactions in length. And then they're off to the races to solve something called the block puzzle. Now the block puzzle is very simple. You have your block and each miner is in this race of trying to find out one random number, which gives us a particular special output. So everyone is trying to find this combination of a block, a random number, which come together to give us a special output. This random number is called proof of work. And the first person to complete this whole block puzzle is rewarded with Bitcoin. And that's how you pump more Bitcoin into the so-called Bitcoin economy. Now, once this miner has their proof of work for the given block, they themselves shouted out like, hey, look, I was able to solve this puzzle. You guys can check it out, make sure it's legit. And then we can add it to the blockchain. And so that's what happens. All the miners on the blockchain verify that the proof of work generated is actually the proof of work needed for that block. Right. And the whole point of this is because anyone is allowed to sort of solve the puzzle and then get it verified. There is decentralization and we do not need to trust any one person because everyone has access to everything, any 
information that lies on the blockchain i could have access to and a billion dollar company could have access to and then again the process starts over with new transaction and more bitcoin being pumped into the economy now what is a block right i've been talking about how transactions are being packed but it's a bit more technical than that you have a lot of information being stored in the block not only about when it took place or maybe what the merkle root is or the script is and all various technical jargon you also have a list of transactions and one important feature you have the hash value of the previous block and so you have a ton of blocks 744000 as of 2022 that link up one after the other in a long and linear chain that's where the name blockchain comes from now we need to take this block data and extract it and then we can go ahead with our solution to the problem i just discussed and so how does hpcc really play into all of this so we are able to take the block data from the bitcoin ledger download it put it onto the landing zone and then spray it onto the thor cluster once we spray it there we can do so much and one more thing is we need big data over here because we are talking about data at the order of like 600 700 gigabytes of data my bare metal cpu is not going to be able to handle that and so we need big data we need hpcc for our project um in the thor cluster we are going to go through the various etl operations we're going to extract the block data store it in a nice csv file and then use that in our two solutions which i will be getting into in a bit once we're done with that we will go and use queries to interact with our solutions through roxy where we will query a particular address to try to figure out whether it's fraudulent or not if our system says that this is fraudulent that's great because now we can send that fraud alert to financial institutions who can further use their resources to look into the address itself now step 1 parsing i talked about how we needed to download the block data and then extract information from it because block data is going to come in a raw hexadecimal format and that's not exactly convenient while you want to work with ecl or edi solution and so the first step is to use python in our case is embedded python to extract the information and store it in a nice beautiful csv file now python is it does a great job it's able to extract almost all the information except for one that is the input address so every transaction is made up of multiple inputs multiple outputs right and a quirk of the blockchain is rather than storing the address that's being input into the transaction it stores the hash of the previous trans transaction and the associated output that we are passing into the transaction and the <clears throat> graphic over here displays that very well so let's say you have a transaction tx and i want to figure out what input address one is so i am going to crawl up through the transaction graph to tx1 and on the way i'm going to see this link between output address 2 and input address 1 and figure out oh hey they're the same output address 2 and input address 1 are the same so that means input address 1 is output address 2 and this that's the same steps we have to go through for each transaction and ecl is great for this because you just have to do this thing called a self join and you're good to go such a simple statement made the entire parsing operation much faster 
And this is how our final data set looks like on HPCC. Once you spray it, this is data we collected for the first 200,000 blocks. And you have all the information you'd require, like transaction hash, the input addresses, the output addresses, the timestamp, the value of Bitcoin being passed from one address to the other in Satoshi. And yeah, we can now go on to use this data in our solution. The first of which is the utilization of time series data. Now, this is a really interesting paper we saw where turns out when you're walking, if I were to record the time interval between each of your steps and then plot it out as a graph, that graph acts as a sort of fingerprint of the person. So let's say I'm going on my 10 kilometer marathon. I record the time interval between each step. And let's say you, the audience, goes on a 10 kilometer marathon. Each of you is going to have your own fingerprint in terms of the time interval and the time series data generated. And that's great because we can take that concept and put it into Bitcoin because each address is going to produce multiple millions, uh, hundreds, hundreds of um, time series data points. And once they produce this data, we can use that as a digital fingerprint of the address. And that's really cool because we were able to run the test on two sets of two addresses. And we got some really like amazing results over here. The first one was testing out two illegal addresses. We wanted to see if we knew one address was illegal, could we figure out whether another address was illegal or whether there was something fishy going on with it. And another test was to see whether if we knew one illegal address, could we use that to show that another address is legit? Like they are going through the regular steps that not engaging in any fraudulent activity. And from the graphs, I think it's pretty obvious that we can. The one on the left shows a lot more overlap than the one on the right. And these are the four data points that really put it in and let us uh, really see the efforts of seven months. So the first output is for the illegal versus illegal address. We see it has a p-value of 0 0.45. Now, what does that mean? Well, p-value is a statistical measure that lets us either accept or reject a hypothesis. And what is our hypothesis here? Our hypothesis is that the time series data produced by the two addresses come from the same user or come from two different users engaging in the same type of activity. And whenever you're doing this kind of P testing, you need to have a threshold. Our threshold was 0 0.05. This is a universally accepted threshold. And we see that our p-value is way above the limit. And so we can say with a high degree of confidence that the two addresses probably engaging in something fishy. The second output shows us that the p-value is less than 0 0.05. And this is our comparison of an illegal and legal address. And a p-value less than 0 0.05 means we can reject the hypothesis that the two users are engaging in similar activity. And so that's great because now we can create a database of illegal addresses and use them as references for any new address we'd like to query. So every time a new address comes in um, and let's say the authorities want to check this address out, see whether there's something wrong with it. They can just run it against each of our references to try to figure out whether there's any matches. Now, our second solution, which was to use plain old clustering. Clustering is the process of grouping data points, grouping similar data points, I should say. So the image over here gives us a small example of the same. 
where data points that are tightly grouped come under the same cluster. And the process we use or the algorithm we use was trimmed k-means. Trimmed k-means is just a variation of the normal k-means algorithm, except that at the end, we try to trim out outliers. The first step in k-means is to select a random point as a centroid and then take the points that are closest to it and assign it to one cluster. Once you do that, you try to find the new centroid of each cluster and then do the reassignment and so on. You keep doing this until there is not much change in the data points going from one cluster to the other or no change at all. Now, the clusters being formed are not really of import to us. It is of uh, the importance we give is to the outlier data because the outliers are data points that are anomalous and data points that do not conform with any regular patterns of behavior. So what, what would that mean? That would mean that there is a certain Bitcoin address that is not acting like the others. And that's something we'd love to investigate. This is the visualization of around 19,000, 20,000 addresses being plotted to show us the outliers. We see there are some straggling data points towards the end of the graph. And those are the ones we are most interested in. Now, once we take those and we write them down in a list, this is our final output from clustering. Now, at first, it's not really that exciting because it just looks like a bunch of, um, you know, hex data, hex addresses. Um, and so we had to just start Googling each one of them. We had to try to find out whether there's any importance that any of these addresses carried. And luckily for us, the first address itself gave us a hit. Turns out it was involved in the Mount Gox 2014 hack. Mount Gox is or was a Bitcoin exchange that had a ton of Bitcoin stolen from it in 2014. And there were two main addresses involved, which was the first one and the second one that I have pointed out. Now, the first one just kind of took the Bitcoin and has stayed dormant. The second one was very interesting. The second one uh, engaged in behavior um, that you'd expect from a normal crime where they took the uh, Bitcoin from Mt. Gox and then spread it out, subdivided it to multiple other wallets. Now, I'm sure a lot of these other addresses were also involved in crimes. We just need to find other verification techniques for the same. And that's it. That is our solution. Um, coming to the big picture, how can this solution be expanded? How can we take this a step further? So the first thing is we don't need to restrict ourselves to Bitcoin. That was Bitcoin is, of course, the most popular cryptocurrency, and that's why we've been working on it. But we can use these same techniques in other cryptocurrencies like Ethereum or Tether, Dogecoin, Litecoin, anything, especially with the rising use of Ethereum with regard to NFTs and the use of smart contracts. It would be very interesting to see the results on the same. And we don't have to restrict ourselves to cryptocurrency. We can go outside to other industries with credit card fraud detection. Because what we've done here is rather than relying on raw transaction data, we are trying to look at the person, the user behind each transaction. We're trying to look at transaction behavior as a whole. And so we can engage across various currencies and also across different industries. And yeah, thank you for attending the talk and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the event.
That was a great presentation. Dr. Shubas, Center of Excellence in Cognitive Intelligence Systems for Sustainable Solutions, represents really a breakthrough for HPC systems in that very important area. Also, as we listen to Rohan, we now we can see how HPC systems can help in this behavioral analysis of the Bitcoin blockchain and other blockchain solutions um, to identify this sort of anomalous illegitimate transactions in the blockchain. Um, it is uh, certainly an area that requires far more research, but it has a very significant amount of potential. And I look forward to knowing more of this in the future. But now we need to move on to our next keynote. This keynote presentation, and many of you might have been waiting for it um, all morning, is the one that Gavin Halliday will deliver on uh, aspects around our HP systems platform, present and future. Without any more preamble, let's go to Gavin. Hello, and welcome to this presentation about what's new in HPCC. As Flavio said, my name is Kevin Halliday, and I'm one of the developers on Richard Chapman's team. If you have any questions, then please ask them in the chat, and I can respond to them as we go along. So, where are we with HPC Systems Platform? Version 8.4 was released just before last year's conference. It was the first version that we thought was suitable for production use in the cloud. So with cloud support ticked off the list, what has the platform team been up to since then? Well, unfortunately, reality has a habit of challenging our expectations and assumptions. Much of the last year has been a learning curve addressing the real life complications of running HPCC on the cloud. In fact, taking a closer look at those complications will be instructive for anyone who's planning to move a project to the cloud, not just HPCC. So where did we face a reality check? Well, Kubernetes promises to allow you to only use and pay for resources when you need them. You can scale them up where the load is high and scale them right down when it's unused. That's brilliant in theory, but what about in practice? Well, resizing isn't instant. If you suddenly request several hundred new nodes in your Kubernetes cluster, it may take the cloud provider a few minutes to assign them. That time is outside the platform's control, but what you don't want to do is to repeat a, repeat a cycle of requesting large numbers of nodes and then releasing them again. But if you start and stop a new Thor instance for each grafter, that's exactly what might happen. This would be especially painful if you have a query with lots of graphs. This is why we added an option for Thor to continue running or linger until the work unit completes. There's also a similar option to allow Thor instance to be reused by multiple work units, which is very useful if you typically process lots of small queries. So, once the cloud providers allocated the virtual machines, the Docker image for the platform needs to be copied onto them before they can be used. With an image of nearly two gigabytes, this was sometimes taking a minute or so. So cutting the image size by stripping symbols or removing unused functionality can make a big difference, helping to reduce that startup time. In a similar vein, stripping the symbols from generated queries helps reduce the time to start a Roxy. And talking of Roxy, how do you ensure that when you scale up a Roxy cluster, that it's ready to process queries as soon as possible? Queries often rely on a lot of data, much of which is cached in memory. If all the data needs to be retrieved from the files, a query will, work, will run very slowly. So Roxy now records the sections of the indexes that are frequently used for each channel. So when the replica of a channel is started, Roxy uses the information to preload the important data and prime the cache, minimizing the time before that Roxy node is ready. So even if the nodes are ready and available, it can take several seconds to run a job or start a new pod in Kubernetes. If all you're doing is compiling a small ECL query that only takes a couple of seconds, that's a significant overhead. So the system now automatically compiles small queries on a lightweight process, only launching a Kubernetes job when it is needed. 
So the dynamic scaling of Kubernetes is great, but we had to adapt to the reality that it often takes a noticeable time to scale up. One issue with running systems on the cloud is you have little control over what else is running on the same hardware. Affinities and Taints provide some control for your own software, but the cloud provider is at perfect liberty to run applications from other customers at the same time. That can lead to unexpected contention for resources. One way of ensuring nothing else is running on a physical machine is to request pods and nodes that use the entire machine resources. This is the idea behind the Thor option to run multiple workers in the same pod, where the memory of the pod is then shared between the workers. And what happens if worker nodes are not evenly distributed over the virtual machines? If it causes some of them to run slow, the whole job will run slowly. We suspected that this might have been occurring, so Thor now reports how the workers are distributed over the different nodes to help diagnose that problem. What else? The network is also not under your control. The bandwidth assigned to each virtual machine is limited and cloud providers may start dropping packets if limits are exceeded. In previous versions, the Roxy UDP layer would have really struggled. It has now been redesigned to cope with packet loss. And some aspects of temporary files were a bit of a surprise. Did you know that some cloud virtual machine instances do not use local disk for temporary files? Coming from a bare metal background, that's not what you would expect. So be very careful which instance types you choose. And even the machines that do have fast local NVMe disks need extra support in the Helm charts to make them available to the platform. We also found Kubernetes does not necessarily clean up those temporary files. So if you're not careful, those NVMe drives will fill up. So the system needed extending to ensure that they are cleaned up properly, even when the pod crashes or is terminated by Kubernetes. So as you can see, having less control over the environment required some changes and extra checks to make sure it works well to spot potential problems. Now, Zero touch is often promoted as one of the beneficial side effects of moving to the cloud. Systems are dynamic, so you don't want operations starting and stopping them by hand. Instead, all configuration is code and there's no need or even ability for operators to access the running systems. This is brilliant, up to the point when something goes wrong. If the system acts like a black box that you can't touch, how can you diagnose any problems? You can't connect to the machines to look at the logs or debug the processes. Well, one way is to spot problems early. The system can publish metrics to Prometheus, so you can monitor and proactively spot problems. Only a few metrics are currently published, but the number will grow over the next year or so. When something does go wrong, the system now automatically archives detailed logs, information from core files and anything else that is useful for investigating an issue, eliminating the need for access to those black boxes. On bare metal, logging often goes to the local disk. On the cloud, that makes no sense. Local disks are ephemeral. So the platform has a new framework for remote logging services. This includes out of the box support for Elasticsearch and Azure Log Analytics, both sending the logs to the remote services and then querying them from within ECL Watch. We also provide Helm charts to help run an Elastic Stack instance on Kubernetes, which has had some major usability enhancements. So you configure deployments to a Kubernetes cluster with Helm files, but how do you automate the creation of the Kubernetes clusters themselves? The network links, storage, that's where Terraform comes in. We now publish a set of Terraform modules in a separate repository with support for the creation of HPC clusters. Some of the most recent improvements are support for data spread over multiple storage accounts and integration with GitHub Actions. So Zero Touch provides benefits, but you need to think through what implications it has for debugging and supporting development. Moving systems to the cloud brings security into sharp focus. It feels like everyone could get it. 
you're no longer in control of the network infrastructure and everything needs to be cleanly locked down. We thought HPCC supported everything that was needed, but unfortunately, development systems like Docker Desktop don't enforce the network policies. Once they were enforced, it revealed a few issues. The biggest problem was actually that the controls were too strict. You want to control egress to prevent exfiltration of data and connecting to rogue servers. But initially, the controls were so tight, it made it impossible to pull valid external services or download source code for remote compiling. There were some similar problems with communication between Thor pods with ECL agent nodes connecting to lingering Thors. So a key lesson to take away is that if you are developing a Kubernetes solution, make sure you test it with the network policies in force. Secret support is a whole topic on its own, but for production use, you really need to use something like HashiCorp Vault so that you can easily rotate your secrets. That was already supported in most areas, but we needed to make sure that it was supported everywhere. Another side benefit of moving to the cloud was to ensure that Active Directory was configured as securely as possible to automate deployment. There's now a separate service to automate setting up environments, allowing a deployed environment to have no need for system user access rights. And finally, there's the whole topic of creating a network of trust between components using client certificates, certificate managers, MTLS, which is all now supported by the platform. I don't pretend to understand all the details. If you have any questions, please reach out to Tony Fishbeck, who does, and will be very happy to help. Now, cloud storage is different from bare metal, and often in subtle ways. Some of the assumptions that the platform has long made about files and storage no longer apply. For instance, the platform tends to assume that storage is relatively quick with little latency. But if you're using the cheapest storage options, for instance, blob storage on Azure, that's no longer the case. So what problems did we hit and what solutions did we come up with? On Azure, the throughput to each storage account is capped. And a single storage account didn't provide enough bandwidth to support a 400-way Thor cluster. To work around this, the platform now allows the parts for a logical file to be distributed or striped over multiple storage accounts. We found that using 20 accounts easily provides Thor with the throughput it needs. And Roxy indexes read fairly small chunks at a time and assume a very low latency. Unfortunately, this is almost an anti-pattern for using cheap blob storage. To mitigate this, Azure provides the option of a fast caching layer called HPC Cache that sits in front of the blob storage. But using that presents a conceptual problem to the environment. Thor needs to write indexes to the blob storage, but Roxy wants to read them via HPC Cache. But it isn't two different storage options, locations because the file either exists in both places or neither. So storage plane aliases were added to allow us to represent that underlying reality. Another example of a difference is scanning a directory. On a local disk, it is very fast. The same thing on blob storage is slow and potentially expensive. Now, unfortunately, the file copy encode in Roxy was a place that was scanning directories and needed refactoring to avoid it. But it's not all problems though. Storage not being tied to the compute nodes also provides scope for improving how things are done. For example, files are no longer stored on the Roxy nodes, so Roxy doesn't need to be running to copy them there. It makes much more sense to copy them when a package is deployed. That way you can guarantee all the files are available before any Thor instance is started. That's why the system now has an option to create a DFU work unit to manage and track this copy. Of course, even better than running a process to copy files is to use a call to the cloud provider API to do it for you. It is likely to be much quicker, cheaper, more resilient. We have a proof of concept working and it's going to be available in the next version. So cloud storage provides some advantages and opportunities 
but you may also need to re-examine some of your most fundamental assumptions to get it working properly. And finally, costs. With an on-prem system, you know your costs. You have a fixed number of servers and the disk space is fixed. Costs are something that the person commissioning the system needs to worry about, not the ECL users. Both of these restrictions can be a pain though. The fixed number of servers means you have to wait for other jobs to complete. And the fixed disk size means you have to regularly clean up redundant files to prevent it filling up. In the cloud, that's turned upside down. It'd be completely possible to configure systems that every job that was submitted immediately started up a Thor cluster to process it. Disk space is virtually unlimited. In other words, it's a perfect recipe for running up enormous bills. And it's a bit late if you find out at the end of the month that you've spent a few extra million dollars. You need to know now, and each developer needs to share some responsibility for spotting issues. So ECL Watch now presents estimates of the compute and file cost to the user. The aims to provide a reasonably accurate estimate of the extra cost incurred running the job. It's never going to be perfect, but it should be good enough for you to compare costs between jobs from run to run and spot anomalies. So that summarizes the major cloud issues we encountered and some of the steps we've taken to address them. Does this mean that the latest version is only interesting if you're running in the cloud? Well, I could be tempted to say yes and finish the talk early, but unfortunately you don't get to escape quite that easily. There are plenty of other improvements, even if you're only ever going to run the system on bare metal. Roxy has had a lot of improvements. For instance, we've recently added an option to lock memory which has solved a long-standing problem of intermittent, unexplained slowdowns. Other improvements have reduced the overhead of publishing new queries, allowing them to be deployed and available much more quickly. I've already mentioned many of the changes, like the reduced directory scanning, better resilience in the UDP layer, and improvements to file copying. There are also plenty of other small fixes and optimizations throughout the code. One of the more significant performance improvements reduces the latency before Roxy call, query can call an external SOAP service. That can often be a limiting factor for the overall latency of a query. And if part of your job is trying to work out how to speed up Roxy queries, then don't miss Krishna's breakout session later, which includes details of new statistics and other improvements that will make it easier to understand where the time is spent in your Roxy queries. If you use Roxy, then make sure you upgrade to the most recent version, even if you have no intention of moving to the cloud. I've already mentioned introducing costs into Easy Watch. Although this is mainly aimed at cloud systems, they can also be configured for bare metal systems to give an idea of relative costs. There are also usability improvements and support for cloud topology and logging. If you're interested in finding out more, make sure you catch Rodrigo's breakout session later today. But most of the work in Easy Watch has gone into migrating to a modern JavaScript framework. What was a preview a year ago is now close to complete. The new version provides a great base for extending and adding new features. Maybe the biggest remaining problem with it is knowing what to call it. One neat feature is the preview toggle in the title bar. It allows you to switch back and forwards between the two versions without losing your context. This makes it much easier to try out the new version. Testers are very welcome to check the usability, highlight missing features, provide suggestions for improvement. Probably the biggest new feature in the code generator is improving the support for compiling ECL directly from Git repositories. Some of these changes, like the speed improvements and support for Git LFS, were so significant and relatively safe that we backported them to 7.12. But to take advantage of all the changes, you need to use a modern version. This slide contains a summary of the higher level bullet points. If you want to know more, Greg will walk through the topic in detail in his breakout session later in the day. 
Now, from time to time, I'm asked to look at a query which seems to be executing something twice or taking a very long time to compile. It's almost always instructive. Often after investigation, I discover there is a problem. Well, what I found interesting is that when I fixed the issue, I discovered it was already silently affecting several other queries. I say this partly as an encouragement to report problems. If you see behavior you cannot explain, don't suffer in silence. It may help other people as well as yourself. But I can also think of at least three examples of fixes over the past year which have followed on from investigating queries that have significantly improved the generated code for a whole range of queries. And some of the other code generators changes like prefetch fit in with the Roxy improvements for reducing query latency or reducing the Roxy startup time. Finally, a few other items that are worth quickly mentioning. If you are working with David's TARDIS project, then you may be interested to know about the improved access to HPCC data, which will be ongoing and improving over the coming year. And if you use VS Code for easy development, there are plenty of improvements. One big one is support for EZL notebooks, which Jim will be demonstrating in a session later on. If you use ESP for calling services, then take a look at the extensions to the ESDL scripting to make it more flexible, supporting, executing things in the background and functions. And although it doesn't quite qualify, it's this year's work because it just squeezed into 8.4. This worth highlighting the new NLP plugin that several of this year's interns have been using. And as usual, there have been many bug fixes in each of the components. These include fixes for the log4j issue in some of the related Java components. You'll be glad to know there is documentation for the new features, both in the official documentation but also many examples and documents are checked in along with the platform source. If you haven't had a look at the HPC systems blogs, then why not take a look? There you'll find blogs written by the developers on many of the features I've already mentioned. They often give more background on why you would use that particular feature as well as how to use it. So, and what are the future? I think I can guarantee in the next year there will be further improvements aimed at the cloud and security, but I doubt that will be all. Let me throw out a few possibilities. It can be a hard work working out where the time is going in a Roxy query. The graphs can be very large with multiple branches being executed at the same time. The new statistics in 8.6 at least give you the information you need. It would be much nicer if that was automated and presented to you as a neat summary. Now, there's no question mark at the end of this one because we are currently finishing off the first version. Similarly, expect to see support soon for copying files using the cloud API. But are there other cloud services HPCC can take advantage of? And more speculatively, well, the format of indexes hasn't changed in many years. Could we make changes to improve their performance, especially when we're using cloud storage? Um, cloud nodes on compute nodes on the cloud are more ephemeral than in a data center. How do we improve Thor to make it more resilient? Can we make it continue where it left off or automatically recover from a node being lost? And can anything be done about the complex helper warnings and other issues that can make easy old compiles take forever? Well, we have plenty of ideas for tackling these and other topics. Maybe I'll be talking about some of them next year. Until then, there are plenty of other improvements to get your teeth into. So thank you, and um, back to Flavio. That was an amazing talk, Gavin. Certainly, as you mentioned at the very, very beginning, reality sometimes gives uh, its own perspective of things, right? Uh, and while in theory, you might come up with great ideas, many times you need to make sure that you match them with what reality offers and uh, and make sure that those ideas can be applicable. And also, um, it is an amazing number of new capabilities. And you, you went through all sorts of areas, including 
uh, user interaction, ECL watch improvements, um, all of the uh, cloud improvements, which are, which are uh, really many of them, and certainly the interoperability with other systems as well. So it is, um, I'm just looking forward to seeing many of these things just come to fruition. Uh, some of them are already out there, as you mentioned, some of them are in early stages, but uh, certainly all of them are being delivered, which is great. Now, I want to close this uh, track, this, uh, pl this plenary keynote sessions, but I want you, the attendees, to go to the breakout sessions. We will have a number of breakout sessions throughout three tracks. Um, there are 15, 20 breakout sessions, and uh, many of them cover so many different aspects that you will really want to attend at least one in each one of the tracks. But despair not, all of these are of course recorded, so you can always go back and watch the ones that you missed. Go through your agenda, I'm sure you already booked them, and see which one comes next, attend them, and uh, don't forget to go back and listen to some of the others, which will still be there for you to listen to anytime you want. In addition to the breakout sessions, we will have our posters out there so you can always go back and browse those posters. I'm sure you voted already and that has been closed now, but um, you can go and see the posters that we have there. There are so many interesting posters, more than, well, there are 15, 20 posters right now. And I'm sure you will enjoy many, many of them. They cover such broad different areas that um, it is likely to um, at least pick your attention um, in, uh, in some of them. And last but not least, once we are done with all of the breakout sessions and you spend that little time browsing the posters and some of our booths as well, we will have the closing session. That closing plenary session is going to be great as well. We have our code day uh, organizer um, and a number of our um, internal LexisNexis Office Solutions community members as well that will be discussing and, and presenting some of the activities happening with the communities. Things like hackathons, go days in general, and, and other community activities, which are going to um, set for a great year as we, as we move forward. So take a very short reprieve, come back for the breakout sessions, browse the posters, and see us for the closing in that plenary session. Thank you.